Right, so we're continuing this week to talk about South Asian uh, migrant literature. Uh, this time we're going to be looking at one of the most important novels by um, one of the greatest living um, Indian writers in English, uh, Salman Rushdie. Um, now, when this book was first published uh, in the late 1980s, um, I remember I was in the fifth grade at the time, um, it, uh, it really pissed a lot of people off. Um, now, we're not going to talk so much about why that was this week, um, and we're going to devote our more detailed analysis of the novel uh, to next week when you've finished reading it. Um, so what I really want to do today is just introduce uh, or reintroduce to you in some cases a couple of key concepts um, for thinking about the novel and the way the characters interact with their environment um, and sort of give you some things to follow for when we do our more um, contextualized discussion next week. So the first thing that I want you thinking about as you read this is the concept of alterity. Um, now, I introduced this to you briefly in the introductory lecture, but I want to uh, go into a little bit more detail about this since I think it is, this is really important for understanding migrant literature generally. Right? Because you're talking about um, writers who are operating in contexts where they were always in some sense or other from the people around them. So alterity, you, you may remember, I hope you remember, is otherness in a pair, right? The condition of being the other in a group of two, right? The alter, the person who is subject to alterity is, not, is always the other, the object, right? So in philosophy, the altar is the entity in opposition to which the self constructs its identity. So the altar is always, again, that which is not you, which you define specifically as not you. Now, a lot of early post-colonial theory rests on this idea of alterity. For example, um, probably the, one, the, one of the great classic works of post-colonial criticism is Edward Said's book, Orientalism. And in that book, Said sets the Oriental up as a sort of altar for the Occidental, right? So the Westerner defines himself in particular ways and projects the qualities he does not wish to see on him, see himself onto the Easterner. If the Westerner is chaste, the Easterner is promiscuous. If the Westerner is industrious, the Easterner is lazy. Um, you see what I'm saying, right? I think you get the idea. So the concept is probably most fully developed uh, in the French thinker Emmanuel Levinas's book, Ethics of the Other. That's Levinas. Happy little French guy. So, one thing that Levinas wants us thinking about is that in the encounter with the other, there is both proximity and distance, right? There is physical closeness between the self and the other, but a gulf in terms of self-identification. For whatever reason, you are unable to fully identify with the other, with the altar. The appearance of the other the physical proximity of the other to you demands that you affirm or deny his or her humanity in relation to your own. Right. So your other is right there in front of you and you need to decide in that moment whether you are going to continue to treat this person as other or accept your common humanity. Levinas argues that we have a moral obligation towards recognizing the humanity of the other, right? The ethical path is to recognize the other in ourselves. The unethical path is to continue to deny the other's humanity. Um, 
this might be helpful uh, in thinking about the scene in which Saladin Chamcha is accosted by the British police, who no longer recognize him as a British citizen or even as human in the usual sense, right? All right. Another concept I want you thinking about as you're reading this, which can also relate actually pretty well to that police scene, is uh, the idea of interpolation. So this is a term coined by the French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser in 1971. Now Althusser argues that there are two basic systems for reproducing ideology in any given society. Now you'll recall that ideology is essentially sort of like the value system of the ruling class of a society that then sort of gets absorbed by everybody else, right? So Althusser sees two methods of promoting ideology in a society, reproducing ideology. The first he calls ideological state apparatuses. And these largely have to do with private behavior, the private sphere, private association, right? Um, you are, your family, for example, is an ideological state apparatus, right? You grow up absorbing the rules of the family. The school, is an ideological state apparatus, right? You are taught to conform to the standards of your society. Ideological state apparatuses use social pressure rather than force to promote ideology. Repressive state apparatuses, on the other hand, are public, they're an arm of the state, and they ruthlessly enforce and police ideology, right? The police and the military would be repressive state apparatuses, right? They enforce the ideology of the ruling class using violence if necessary, or at the very least, the threat of violence. So the means by which both ISAs and RSAs induct subjects into ideology, Althusser calls interpolation. Right? This is how they get you. This is how they start inducting you into the ideology of your particular society. So it happens through your participation in ritualized social actions. Right? If you, you behave in the expected way, um, one of the examples that Althusser gives is, you know, say somebody knocks on your door. You say, who is it? You do not let them in until they respond, right? You have then been the interpolating agent in that exchange, right? Until they give the accepted greeting that acknowledges your private property you don't let them in the door. The other example Althusser uses is of a policeman hailing you in the street. The minute you turn around, you accept that you are subject to that policeman's authority. Right? That the policeman, by virtue of his uniform and position in society, has a right to stop you. This is interpolation, right? This is making yourself subject to the values of the society that you live in through social interaction. So what I want you to do with this particular concept, right? As you're reading the novel, think about Jibril Farishta and Saladin Chamsha and the various agents that are trying to interpolate them, right? They're trying to draw them into particular ideological state apparatuses or repressive state apparatuses um, and what position the ISAs and RSAs seem to assign them in society. Now as far as the title is concerned, 
right? I remember not knowing anything about the book. Again, when I was in fifth grade, it came out. I was like, ooh, the satanic verses, right? This must be creepy stuff about the devil, right? Um, it's not really. Um, apart from the fact that Saladin Chamcha does turn into um, a sort of hairy goat beast with um, horrible sulfurous breath. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about what the title means because it's going to be important for understanding the plot, particularly of the episodes featuring uh, the sort of fantasy version of the Prophet Muhammad, right? The uh, so-called Mahound episodes. So, according to Islamic folklore, at one point in his ministry, the Prophet Muhammad mistook words that were suggested to him by a demon for divine revelation from the Archangel Jibreel. Now, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the uh, story behind the composition of the Quran, so let's just say that the various chapters of the Quran, which are called surahs, um, are believed by Muslims to have been recited directly to Muhammad by the archangel, um, Muslims call him Jibreel, he's you know, the same figure as the archangel Gabriel um, in Judeo-Christian tradition. So yeah, the, satan the, satanic, the so-called satanic verses are lines suggested not by Jibreel, but by a devil posing as Jibreel, by an imposter. Um, the lines in question appear in the 53rd surah of the Quran, uh, which is known as the star. All of the surahs, the chapters of the Quran, are named for a particular um, image in them that is uh, especially memorable. And these lines appear to encourage the worship of three goddesses who were popular in the city of Mecca in the pre-Islamic era. Um, a lot Uza and Manat. Um, Alat was a sort of mother goddess. Um, Uza was often identified with the Greek Aphrodite. She seems to have been a goddess of sort of love, fertility, and sexuality. And Manat uh, was a, a goddess of fate and of destiny. So the authentic lines, the ones that actually appear in the 53rd Surah, say, have you heard of Alat and al -Uza? and Manat the third, the other. The supposed satanic line is, these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is hoped for. So the suggestion is that in this new religion Muhammad is proposing, which hitherto have been focused on the worship of a single Sort of masculine principal deity is making accommodation with popular religion in Mecca, with goddess worship in Mecca, right? That you want these goddesses to intercede for you with Allah. Right now, <clears throat> within Islam, this would be, you know, within contemporary Islam, this would be heresy. And that's what makes uh, this particular little episode both interesting and problematic. So what I want you to think about is sort of the intercessory nature of female characters in the novel. For whom do they intercede? With whom? With what powers? Where do we see um, you know, sort of analogs of these goddesses popping up in the larger narrative. Oh, that isn't supposed to work that way. All right, well, our two protagonists, interestingly enough, are actors. And I think this is really, in a lot of ways, appropriate for a novel about migrants who have to play a number of different roles, often completely different roles when they're back at home, when they're in the, you know, their um, new country of residence, 
right? So our first is Jibril Farishta. And Farishta is a Bollywood star. Right, he's a big guy in the Indian film industry, whose disappearance causes some consternation at the beginning of the novel, right? He's born Ismail Najmuddin to a poor Muslim family, right? Both of our protagonists are Muslim, but Jibril specializes in religious films, particularly the portrayal of Hindu gods in religious films. And loses his religious faith after mysterious illness. So we have here an example of the kind of role in a Bollywood movie um, Farishta would, would be playing, right? This is you know, an, an image of uh, an actor playing the god Krishna. So Farishta, despite his Muslim origins, he doesn't seem to be particularly religious, right? Um, spends his career pretending to be various gods in a religion that he doesn't actually follow, right? Now, his counterpart, Saladin Chamcha, is born into a wealthy Muslim family, a Salahuddin Chamchawala. So, neither of these guys go by their real names, right? Jibril Farishta has come up with a completely different name for himself. Saladin Chamcha has truncated his original name to make it a little bit less clunky for English speakers. He has a strained relationship with his rich father, um, as uh, we note in the episode um, where he, well, first the episode um, in which he comes to London with his dad and his father then expects him to pay for everything. And then when he goes back home to find out how his father has been living uh, in his absence, right, with both new wife and with wife of longtime family servants after the death of Solomon's mother. He is English educated, right, and really kind of bloody minded about his desire to be English. Um, one episode that might be interesting to think about in terms of interpolation and alterity is um, when Saladin is, what, what happens when Saladin is first confronted at breakfast in his English school with a kipper and no one shows him how he's supposed to eat it. Finally, Chamcha is um, an avowed assimilationist, right? His goal seems to be to be as English as possible. He marries an English woman, though the marriage appear, is you know, childless and appears to be, at least by the end, largely loveless. Um, he seems to, he would probably have voted for Margaret Thatcher. Um, he is no use for the causes that his other um, Asian friends espouse. Um, and he willingly conforms at some points to the roles he is assigned by his English peers. Uh, for example, you know, he's back in India in the first place. He's playing a role in a George Burton Shaw play, the role of the Indian doctor. But he's primarily a voice actor, right? Someone who is heard but not seen. Think about that in terms of the Satanic Verses uh, legend. And he's best known as a character on this children's program called The Alien Show. More about that in a moment. So as actors, essentially what these guys do for a living, right, is imitate and interpret. 
Right? They're given lines to read. They're given characters to play, roles to play, that are in, you know, at, on some level at odds with their authentic selves. All right, so let's start with Jibreel. His big break arrived with the coming of the theological movies. Once the formula of making films based on the Puranas and adding the usual mixture of songs, dances, funny uncles, etc. had paid off, every god in the pantheon got his or her chance to be a star. When D.W. Rama scheduled a production based on the story of Ganesh, none of the leading box office names were willing to spend an entire movie concealed inside an elephant's head. Jibril jumped at the chance. That was his first hit, Ganpati Baba, and suddenly he was a superstar, but only with the trunk and ears on. So, by stepping into this costume, right, the role of a Hindu god, Jibril manages to make himself a star, but only by disguising his own features, by distorting his own features, by pretending to be something rather greater than what he is. And yet also, interestingly, a god that is, that has both human and animal characteristics. Now, as for Saladin, his big break, right, note the very, very similar phrase, the parallel phrasing in these passages. They occur in different chapters. His big break, the one that could soon make money lose its meaning, had started small children's television, a thing called The Alien Show, by the monsters out of Star Wars by way of Sesame Street. It was a situation comedy about a group of extraterrestrials. The stars of the show, it's Kermit and Miss Piggy, were the very fashionable, fashionable slinkily attired, stunningly hairstyled duo, Maxime and Mama Alien, who yearned to be, what else, television personalities. They were played by Saladin Chamcha and Mimi Mamoulian. Mimi Mamoulian, we find out, um, is herself um, an actress of Armenian Jewish descent, so she also has a migrant past. And they changed their voices along with their clothes to say nothing of their hair. The backgrounds were all simulated. So everything about Saladin's defining role is that it's changeable, it's protean, right? and nothing on the set, nothing that he interacts with in the show, even down to his own clothes and hair, right, is real. Everything is generated by a computer. So he's performing in a false world, a constructed world, an artificial world, a world with no solidity. These, by the way, are those three goddesses that I mentioned uh, at the uh, beginning of the uh, lecture here. Uh, that is Alat, Uza, and Manat. So there are a couple of key female characters I want you to pay attention to as agents of interpretation as interpolation, right, as um, figures who draw Jibreel and Saladin into, or attempt to draw them into, various uh, ideologies, right? <clears throat> there is Jibreel's dead lover, Rekha Merchants, who appears on a flying, who appears to him on a flying carpet um, as he's falling from the sky, and who will appear at other times as well. She will not leave him alone. The lover he left her for, the mountain climber, Alleluia Cone, who has her own migrant history behind her. Chomcha's wife, Pamela Lovelace. His Indian lover, Zini Vakil. 
And you might also want to think about Changez Chamchawala's, uh, that is uh, Saladin's father's, sort of trio of goddesses, right? His first wife, his second wife who shares her name, and the servant woman who wears her clothes and lives in her house on the weekends. Oh, and also, Hyacinth Phillips, the Caribbean uh, physical therapist in the hospital where Chamcha ends up after his incident with the police. Now you also probably want to think about hybridity as a broader concept here. Right. Many of these incidents of hybridity in the novel have to do specifically with Chamcha. There's this cross-cultural marriage, his transformation into a man goat. Man goat. The other human animal hybrids, right? All of them apparently other migrants in the hospital ward where he finds himself. And I think that Farishta's madness is also brought on by something like hybridity, right? Something like an inability to quite reconcile um, his experience of the world with his idea of himself. His inability to, um, rec to reconcile his Indian Muslim identity with his other role as Bollywood star and interpreter of Hindu goddom to film audiences. Um, so that's really all I've got for you on this for now. Um, I want you to finish reading the novel and when we get back to talking about it next week, we'll think in more detail about how all of this shakes out. Um, so I look forward to seeing your first responses on the discussion board, um, and we'll talk there.